Today I want to talk to you around this idea of who is Jesus. Now we're doing a study in the Gospel of John, and we're going to look at some very specific things as I begin to unwrap this for you, because if you don't know whose you are, you won't know who you are. The world will tell you what your identity should be. Your identity is in your money. Your identity is in your your talents or gifts. Your identity is in your sexuality. It'll say lots of different things. But if you know who Jesus is, then you can know who you really are created to be. And so today I want to talk to you around this idea of Jesus is the bread of life. C.S. Lewis, who was a, a brilliant writer, said this. He said, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him. You can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open for us, and he did not intend to. Jesus can't claim to be God in the flesh. He is either truly our Lord, a liar, or a lunatic. Can can you guys give me my Mr. Potato Head right down front here? Uh, How many of you ever had Mr. Potato Head growing up? Come on, it's a great one. I don't know that I think he's been canceled because you can't say that anymore, so we'll bring him back. We live in a Mr. Potato Head culture where people view Jesus and they say, well, I like Jesus, but I don't like his mustache. I don't like, I don't know if he had a mustache, but you're getting the idea. I like Jesus, but I don't want him to see what I did. I want him to be good with it. So my Jesus is totally cool if I'm wicked because he's just a good guy. Mr. Rogers wouldn't hurt a flea. I don't want him to hear what I said. Gossip, slander, nasty, filthy. Jesus ain't listening. It's all good. See, my Jesus, you know, he wouldn't do anything about that. He has no no arms. This is how I like to view my Jesus. And if you don't know who Jesus is, there's great potential within our culture for you to worship a God made in your, your image, meaning your creation, rather than the God of creation. Because Jesus, well, He says He he really can hear us, and what we say is important. He really does have outstretched arms, and He wants to give grace, but He also says that judgment is coming. He really does see us, and He knows what's happening in our world, and uh, I'm pretty sure he, He doesn't have a mustache, unless it looks good for you. Any mustache people, come on, just... Dwight has the best mustache. I don't even know if you have it right now. The best mustache. Tombstone right there. Has nothing to do with the message. Eric, here you go. Mr. Potato Head. We have this tendency to think, well, I like to think about Jesus as this. And most of the world, when they talk about Jesus, they talk about the devil, but they give it Jesus' his name. They say, Jesus is okay with my sin. Jesus is okay if I do whatever I want to do. He just wants me to be happy. I need to follow my heart, follow what I feel, do my thing, and that's my Jesus. But I want to teach you over these next number of weeks, I want to teach you who Jesus is. So let me unwrap these thoughts for a few moments today. The authors of the gospel record the life of Jesus. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four gospels, the letters written about the life of Jesus at the beginning of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels. Everybody say synoptic. It means they're seen together. They they say uh, the same thing in different ways. Uh, I was in Phoenix this past week. We're at a conference, and it was it was actually just as warm here as it was there. But my boys, we were driving. My wife had flown out to go to devoted conference. Come on, ladies, did you have a good time? Half of them are sleeping, still recovering from the conference, but uh, it, was, it was amazing. But my wife called me, and we're driving along, and I'm like, hey, you doing good? Did you have a good morning? Yeah, we just got, grabbed a bite to eat, and we're going to the offices over at Turning Point to meet a few people. And, 
And then she began to talk. She's like, well, we had a good morning. We woke up and we ate this and then we went here and then we did this and then we did that. And she went on and on and showed me all about every single part of her day that morning. And my boys were listening. I said, that's awesome, baby. I'll see you. Have a good day. And I turned to my son and I said, listen, boys, that is the difference between men and women. Men are headliners. Women are small print. Men, they give information. Women are communicating feeling and emotion and detail and all those different things. So I share that. It's, it's just that we're different, right? Have you noticed? I know the world's confused, but have you noticed that we're different? Very different from the basic biology of our lives the whole way through. And this idea, those three Gospels, are the same story but written from a different perspective, okay? But then you go to the Gospel of John. It was the last of the Gospels that was written. It was written on the basis that there, he already knew the first three were written down. So he didn't talk about Jesus' birth, his baptism. He didn't talk about the temptations in the wilderness, confronting demons. He didn't really get into the parables, the Last Supper, or even the agony and Gethsemane. But he focused on something different. You see, Matthew talked about the ancestry of Jesus, that he is the king. Matthew shows Jesus came from Abraham through David and demonstrates that he's the Messiah that was promised from the Old Testament. The book of Mark talks about the humanity of Jesus, that he's the servant. Uh, Luke, excuse me, Mark shows Jesus came from Nazareth, demonstrating that Jesus is a servant. Luke talks about the inclusivity of Jesus, meaning he's the, the son of man. He showed that Jesus came from Adam demonstrating that Jesus is the perfect man. But John, everybody say John. John talks about the divinity of Jesus, that Jesus is not whoever you want him to be, but he's who you need him to be. He is God. And John shows Jesus came from heaven, demonstrating that he really is God. Now, John shows us who Jesus is by highlighting seven signs or miracles. Six of these miracles aren't mentioned in the first three Gospels. John shows us who Jesus is through these seven I am statements. I am. Now, that kind of gives us a picture of going back to the book of Exodus when God revealed himself to Moses. And uh, he, Moses said, who should I say is sending me to free the Israelites, the Jewish people, from Egyptian bondage? And God said, you tell him I am. I am that I am. The I am has sent you. And Jesus picks up on, on this in the book of John, and there's seven things that Jesus said in the book of John. And we're going to walk through each week each of those statements because they communicate and they teach us who Jesus is, not who culture says he is, but who Jesus actually is. And these seven statements uh, help us understand him even more. Now, Matthew chapter 16, let's go there for a moment. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And that's a question that I'm asking at all of our locations, each of our churches, our preachers, we're talking about this idea. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because we, the Bible teaches who he is. I know who he is, but you need to know who he is. You need to understand that he's not just a good moral teacher. He's not just telling you, follow your heart and your feelings and all those things, but he really is God and he wants to do something great in and through your life. Who do you say that I am? And Peter responded, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So we're going to walk through two passages of scripture for a few moments. Whenever you read the Bible, here's how you do it. You don't just isolate one scripture and say, that's my Bible, that's my bumper sticker, that's what I want to hold on to, that's what I like about Jesus. You actually read the book. So you go through and you begin with a chapter, but I would encourage you to read the book. Now, everybody says, I don't have time to read the Bible, I don't have time to pray. But it's not an issue of time, it's an issue of priority. If you get your screen time report from your phone, you're going to notice, uh, man, 10 hours this week, man, 20 hours this week, man, 30 hours this week. It's an issue of priority. So I want to encourage you to read the Word of God because as we're going to talk about, that's how you get to know who Jesus is and who God is. But how do you do that? Well, first thing is you observe. What does the Bible actually say? Who, what, where, when, why? What is it saying? So you observe it. Then you need to interpret it. You say, okay, what does this mean for me? 
What's the historical and cultural aspects that go along with this? And we're going to do this in a passage in just a moment. But this is how you study the Bible. Not what did the U version say about it, not what did the, the book from the Christian authors say about it, because there's all kind of people saying all kind of things. You have to know the Bible for yourself, and the Holy Spirit has promised that He's going to teach you and guide you uh, through the Word of God. And then you're going to walk through, and as we end today, we're going to talk about application. What does this mean for me? So you ready? Come on, strap in your seatbelts. Here we go. Jesus is God. He's not just a friend, not just a good moral teacher. He's not our homeboy. He's not whatever we want him to be. He's everything we need him to be. He is God. In John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning, the Word already existed. Who's the Word? Jesus. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. He's the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Jesus goes on from here, and what we learn about him in this book is he is the great I am. He is God. But the very beginning of the book of John is all about this idea. Jesus is God. I am God. Now, here's something else, and the, the, the key thought within that. Number one, Jesus is God. Number two, Jesus is the bread of life. Well, that's nice, but what does that mean? Well, let's take a deep dive uh, for just a few moments today and talk about it. I was recently uh, in Israel, and I was at the location of the story I'm about to share with you. I was at uh, the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias. In fact, we're at a hotel overlooking. I'll repost the pictures in my story today, uh, but this is the Sea of Galilee. So as we walk through this passage, this is where Jesus walked on the water. I was going to try it, but I thought maybe I shouldn't. I mean, amazing. This is the place where they got into the boats. This is the place where we unwrapped this story. And, and, and the Sea of Tiberias and this location, and I have another picture here. You can to show that real quick. This location is, uh, is my wife beautiful? She is. Um, so this is behind me is, this, is uh, Galilee, Capernaum, the town of Jesus. That's the setting of this story I want to share with you for just a few moments and then uh, I want to teach you something and then preach you something, and it's going to be slap your mama good. Come on, you ready? All right, here we go. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, Jesus talks about being the bread of life. Let's start at the beginning. Verse 1. After this, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, which is actually a lake. It's not a sea. Also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill, and he sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. And Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. He's setting this up because it's a reminder to us. You and I get stressed out when we look to ourselves to provide for all that we need instead of looking to the Lord. It's easy to trust in ourselves, our own ingenuity, our own resources, our own ability, and then things go wrong in life. And we're like, man, I don't know how I'm going to pay that bill. Man, I got this bad doctor report. Man, I have this happened, that happened. What am I going to do? Philip was stressing out about this. Jesus already knew that he was going to take care of it. He just wanted to know if they knew, if they would put their trust in him. So Philip replied, man, if we worked like for months and side jobs, oh, we, couldn't, we couldn't get enough mo money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, hey, there's a young boy with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd? It's Sunday. Chick-fil-A is not open. We can't feed them. We don't have the money. What are we supposed to do? And he said this, tell everyone. Everybody say, everyone. everyone. Sit down, Jesus says. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered 5,000. And if the Duggars were there with the kids, it could have been 10, 15,000. 
Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed it to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish. They all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces, filled the 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. Now, I'm not going to go through every little part of this passage. There's so many things we could bring out. Like I, tell, I could tell you that those 12 basketfuls that were left over wasn't an accident. It was signifying the 12 tribes of Israel and that Jesus was the fulfillment of God's plan and that he was the bread. He was the one that would fill them with what they needed. But they didn't see that. They didn't understand that. So when the people saw him do this, they said, surely he's the prophet that we've been expecting. When Jesus saw they're ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills. And then we fast forward, verse 16, and I'll just paraphrase for a moment. They got into the boat without Jesus as they were crossing over. Storm came, was swamping the boat. Jesus came walking on the water. He called out to them, don't be afraid, I'm here. And immediately they were eager to let him in the boat. Isn't that true that we're eager to turn to God when we, everything falls apart in our lives? Like Jesus, come on, take the wheel, get in the boat, whatever you want. I just want to, I, I trust you instead of myself. We all have that tendency. And the Bible says immediately, everybody say immediately. And immediately they arrived at their destination. I don't know, as soon as he got in the boat, they were just there. Kind of like when I get on the plane, uh, I sleep really well on the plane. How many of you sleep really good wherever you go? That's not a problem. Just raise your hand up. Where's my people? And I love it. I can be asleep before the plane takes off and I wake up and I'm there. It's amazing. We're here hours later. And I normally don't sleep that long, but that's the idea. I don't know if, God, if they were transported or what, but immediately they arrived at their destination. The next day, the crowd stayed on the far shore uh, that the disciples had taken the only boat. They realized Jesus had not gone with them. Excuse me. So they went across to Capernaum, which is a neat town, has a synagogue, all these, uh, all these different things that, uh, that are there that I'll share again uh, today. And they found Jesus there. Now we get to this part of the story. You ready? Rabbi, when did you get here? And he replied, well, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you. <laughs> You want to be with me because I have money. <laughs> My kids want to go out and hang out with me when I pay for their, their meal or pay for things. Isn't that true? In the teenage, teenage years, like, we don't want to be with you, but if you're paying, I'm happy to be with you. I, you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understand the miraculous signs. He's like, like you love the free food, but you want to, don't understand who I am. You, you're trying to make me into something that you want. But I'm about to reveal who I am because I'm more than just what you want. I'm everything that you've ever needed. Come on, somebody. Are you ready? Come on, are you ready? We're about to go there. So Jesus said, said this, don't be so, so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, we want to perform God's work too. What should we do? So Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent, because everything begins with faith. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. But what can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scripture says, Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now lean in. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven, which we just received in Holy Communion. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Like, it'd be awesome if, like, we had that bread all the time. Can you imagine how much money we'd save if you paid for lunch every single day out of the month? I mean, I'd save 10 bucks. That's 300 bucks. Man, I'd be a few grand. Jesus, that's awesome. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So that's interesting. But what would they have heard? So let me teach you something, a little background about this story that hopefully you'll look at it different from, from now on. I don't know a lot about bread making. 
Uh, my daughter and my wife, they like to make homemade bread. Any homemade bread makers? Anyone? Okay. They, they like to make uh, uh, homemade bread. And I'm, when I go to the store and my wife instructs me to get different things from time to time, I look for very specific bread. But bread in the ancient Near East, uh, there are 30 different vitamins and minerals in every single wheat berry. Now, here's a picture coming up behind me of, uh, of a wheat berry. And so what they would do is, uh, I think we have a picture of the millstone. Can we bring that up? Now, you, you remember the millstone where Jesus said, if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, that's why we stand up and speak up against the sexualization of children and all the evil that's pervasive in our culture, not be, because we hate, but because we love. And Jesus wouldn't hurt a flea. Well, Jesus said, and millstones were big, like this, this big, round, and were hundreds of pounds. He said, it'd be better for you to have never been born or to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the sea than for you to cause these little ones to stumble. It's a divine warning. And so this millstone is where they would place these, uh, these seeds and they would grind them with stones on there until it would break up all the flour, all the seed. Now, bread in these times was a very nutritious meal. Now, we have, we have since then genetically modified everything, and that's why we have all the sickness and disease, and this is not a dietary discussion today, but we live in the most unhealthiest nation on the place of the earth, face of the earth, but we have all the food that we want, but we have fake food. And so stay with me. The wheat berry made bread the most nutritious meal that they would eat. It provided 30 different minerals, 30, excuse me, different vitamins. It was incredibly nutritious. Now, today, when we make bread, uh, wheat grain is made up of endosperm, the bran, the fiber, and the wheat germ. The milling process grinds out all these parts together to create a flour. However, the wheat germ is very oily and becomes rancid quickly, meaning it just gets old and nasty real quick. It's not going to last on the shelf in the grocery store. So they take the wheat berry out. The wheat berry is what makes it actually good for you and nutritious. They take it out and then they put in lots of other things. This, and, and they market it well. They say, well, this bread is, uh, it's old time, 647 original, six neck uh, carbs, 40 calories, eight grams of fiber. It's keto friendly. It must be good for me. It's, it's low calorie. Uh, here's another one. This is Dave's Killer Bread. Uh, 21 whole grains and seeds, 5 grams of protein, 5 grams of fiber, 260 uh, mega, uh, grams of uh, something I can't pronounce. Nature's Promise, uh, free from uh, synthetic colors and artificial flavoring. And, you know, it's so good for you because it says Nature's Promise. And here's one. This is Mediterranean flatbread. It says it's from the Mediterranean. It must be really healthy. But if you read through it, you begin to understand it's actually not really healthy. Here you go. Whole grains, oat nut, nutrition, and every bite. Now, they do put some nutrition in there, and we do our best with what we eat and all those things, but it's all been modified, and it's fake food because we've taken out the part of it that actually gives the vitamins, the nu nutrition, and what's needed to make us healthy. Now, why do I, I share that with you? Because all the Jews that are listening to Jesus talk about being the bread of life, you're like, that's cool. I like bread. Don't eat too much. It's high carb. Not really good for you, but I like to, you know, dip it in some oil and, and all that's really good. And for them, this was a nutritious meal. It helped keep them alive. And Jesus is saying, you know, like that bread that you've eaten, that bread that, you've, that you look to, I'm that bread. The world's different, though. The world offers fake food, a fake Jesus, and a false morality. And they say, well, you know what? Jesus, I, like, I think of Jesus as whole wheat. That's, that's good. I mean, look at that. It has 13 grams of whole grain. Not sure what that does for you, but it's good. Mediterranean flatbread. Jesus is from the Mediterranean. This is Jesus bread. It must be like Jesus food and the Jesus juice, and it's got to be good for you. And the marketing is great. 
Now, it does have some value. It does have some good things in it. But ultimately, it's, it's fake food. What the world does is t- tries to create a fake Jesus that wouldn't hurt anyone, that doesn't ask anything from anyone, wouldn't hurt a flea, follow your heart. Jesus wants us to follow us, our heart. My heart says that whole grains of oat nut are really good for me. Jesus wants me to just be happy. And I would be really, really happy if I could eat Dave's killer bread, because I heard it's killer. It's awesome. I'd be really happy. So as long as it makes me happy, then that's what Jesus wants. But the reality is, is that's not necessarily true. Jesus wants us to be holy, to take up our cross and follow him, die to ourselves and understand who he is. Because when we understand who he is, we understand who we are. Because, listen, say it this way. When you, you, when you understand whose you are, you understand, understand then who you are. The culture wants to confuse and dictate who you think you are, what you can do, how you're supposed to act, and how you're supposed to live. But Jesus says, don't fill up on fake food. Come to me. The Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Here's the problem. Our problem is we have a tendency to fill up on things that are not good for us and do not satisfy. And then we say, like much of the culture, statistically, as we see in, uh, as I mentioned earlier, about very small percentage of Christians actually believe the Bible. They believe mostly themselves and a little bit of Scripture. And that's the church in our culture in America. And so it's a reminder for you and I that, listen, are we eating the fake food or are we experiencing the bread of life? Matthew chapter 4 says, it is written, Jesus answered, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus is the word of God. He's the bread of life. Mark 8 says, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, yet you lose your soul? So it's not just about getting a free meal. I prayed, God blessed me, I'm good. No, no, God does bless you and he loves you, but Jesus wants you to be filled with his life, with his grace, with his power so that you can live free and you can set people free. That's who Jesus is. He's the real bread of life. The Bible says in John 6, the people began to murmur. Everybody say murmur. If you have kids, you know exactly what we're talking about. But we do this too. They murmured in disagreement because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, well, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his mom and dad. How can he say he came down from heaven? So they realized he was claiming to be God by saying he was that bread. Why? Because in the book of Exodus chapter 16 and chapter 17, the chosen people of God were brought out of bondage by Moses, the great deliverer, who is a type of Christ in the Old Testament, a foreshadowing of who Jesus is. And Moses brought them out of uh, Egypt, which is a place of bondage, to the brink of the promised land. Two and a half weeks journey, they could have received everything that God had for them. But they begin to murmur and complain because when you complain, you remain. When you praise, that's when you're raised. And they murmured and they complained and God judged them. But ultimately, uh, they first started murmuring, we need some food. And so Exodus chapter 16, he gave them quail because God loves meat. Come on, somebody. You can be a vegetarian if you want to disobey. That's fine. I'm teasing. And frosted flakes were on the desert floor. They called it manna. It was sweet, tasted like honey, but literally meant, what is it? They didn't know what it was. But God gave it to them because it's exactly what they needed. Fast forward, New Testament, they were saying, Jesus, what is it? Who are you? And again, he's saying, I'm exactly what you need. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Stop filling up on fake food and start trusting me. Manna and food in Exodus 16 and 17, fast forward to John chapter six, were both tests to trust in God and in Jesus. Both of these stories specifically focused on chapter six. They point to God's ability to not only meet our needs, 
but pointing to the fact that he is all that we need. So what does it mean? Because we get easily confused and confusion is the seed of deception. We live in a culture that's confused. When you're confused, you're embracing the father of lies. If you're confused about your identity, confused about your obedience, who Jesus is, there's great potential for you to end up filling up with fake food, to miss heaven, and only to experience hell. But Jesus came down. He said, I want you to miss this. I am. I am the bread of life. I said that my wife and I were in Israel a few weeks back. And we went to, uh, we're, we're in Jerusalem. And we had some free time when we were going to get lunch. And our tour guide uh, let us all go. He said, be back at this time. He said, but be careful whenever you buy and pay for the food. Because sometimes the different people, they'll take advantage of you because you don't know the language, because they speak Hebrew. And so we went to a place that smelled good, it looked good, we got in line with everyone. And let's just say that they are not big about personal space in the Middle East. And so we're like elbowing everybody, trying to order. And I looked up and I couldn't repeat what it was because it was a different language. So I pointed to it, I'm like, I want that one, like that number there. And he, and he pretended he didn't speak English. And so I didn't know, I, I didn't want to spend, I didn't want to pay with Apple Pay because I wanted to get change back because I wanted to bring some Israeli money back to show the kids. And so I gave them a $20 bill, even though I knew that the meal wasn't that much because I did the math on, my, uh, on Google and kind of translated the amount. I gave it to him and I said, and he's like, down here. And I'm like, okay. And Michelle's like, he just took our money. He just stole our money. I was like, no, no. He, he didn't steal it, just consider it a donation to the Holy Land. He never gave us our money back, totally, totally deceived us. It was so funny, that night we went to the Wailing Wall to pray. Guess who was at the Wailing Wall praying? Probably asking for forgiveness for defrauding uh, the Americans. I share that thought with you, as it's easy to be deceived. How do you not be deceived? You need to know who Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the way, the truth, and the life. This world will mix lots of things together that sound good, that sound like they'll satisfy, but only Jesus can set you free. So what does it mean that he's the bread of life? It means that you can trust him. Jesus is trustworthy, he's God. It means that he will provide for you. Whether it's in the wilderness, or on the side of the hill, you're sitting there in Galilee, you're sitting at home and you're wondering, God, how's this gonna work out? You need to trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's one of the reasons that we tithe. We give our little bit, we honor God, and he breaks it just like the bread uh, in the fish and multiplies it and gives us all that we need. He's a faithful God. He will provide for you, but don't miss this. He is all you need. John chapter six, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I'm the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. And anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread which I will offer so that the world may live is my flesh. So what was he saying? Who is Jesus? He's God, and He is the bread of life. You can trust in Him. He will provide for you, and He really is all you need. I want to close with this story, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to the mercy and the grace of God. What do you do with that? Well, if you've been eating fake food, it's time to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to receive the truth, the Word of God, who Jesus is that can set you free. To turn from your opinions, to ignore the social contagion of what the culture is trying to get you to go, go, go drink the cultural Kool-Aid or the current thing. And say, no, I'm not gonna accept the counterfeit. 
God creates, Satan counterfeits. Satan removes the truth of who Jesus is, but tries to package it as morality that can set you free. But Jesus is the only one that can satisfy. So in just a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you've been trusting in yourself, if you've been trusting in the wisdom of men, I'm going to give you an opportunity to exchange the lies for the truth of Jesus, to call to Him, to find mercy in your time of need, to acknowledge your sin, which means missing the mark, following your own way instead of God's, and to make Jesus the Lord of your life. But I'm also going to give an opportunity for those of you that already made that decision to do something very important. One of the things that, he set it up in this way, I love when we, my kids were little, we would go to the mall, we'd go to Sam's Club or Costco, you go at just the right time, load the kids into the strollers, and you hit that key time when all the samples are out. Come on, somebody. And if you plan it just right, just right, you don't have to pay for lunch. Especially, you just keep going past uh, the Chinese restaurant. They'll just keep handing out all the different kinds of chicken, and you can fill up right there. Come on, that's wisdom. Come on, come on, somebody. So we used to do that all the time with the kids, and I still like it when we hit the store just the right time uh, that they have the samples. God's calling you and I to to have received Jesus to hand out the bread of life. To say, have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Have you experienced the grace and the mercy of God? Everywhere that you go, all that you do, that you're living this life for God, sharing His goodness, sharing His mercy, sharing His truth, which is kindness, which sets people free. You have an opportunity this week to be a sampler, to give the bread of life that's full of power, grace, mercy, forgiveness, healing that can set people free. You and I can do that. So there's two different groups of people that are here today. Those who have been eating fake food that need to say, Jesus, I believe and I want to trust in you. I'm not following my heart. Life isn't Disney. I'm not following my own way. I'm taking up my cross and I'm following you. And then there's another group of people. We see the world around us. They're loaded up with their critical theory, with the social contagion, their manipulation. And they're like, hey, this month we're going to celebrate this. We're going to honor this. We're going to do, come on, we have everything that you need. Come on, just eat this and you'll be satisfied. And you can watch that and say, okay, Nothing I can do about that. Or you can say, you know what? Step aside. None of that's good for you. I want to give you something that will actually make you never hungry again, never thirsty again, that you're broke, busted, and disgusted, but it'll change your life. And his name is Jesus. And if the church will arise this week and say, I'm going to bring Jesus to my school, to my workplace, to everywhere I am, I'm going to hand out samples of the bread of life and the love of God. It will change people and set them free. Stand with me as we close. Jesus is the bread of life. Within him is found all that you need. Would you pray with me? If you're here today and you say, Sam, I'm not right with God. I've been following the culture, following my own path. If I were to die today, I don't know that I would go to heaven. I've created a Jesus based on my opinions. But now I realize that Jesus is God and he's the bread of life. So I want to repent today. I want to change my thinking. I want to change my behavior. I want to place my faith in the Lord. If that's you, in just a moment, I want to give you an opportunity to do just that. The Bible says that God so loved the world, He loves you and I, that He sent His one and only Son, that's Jesus, that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all followed our heart to the wrong way. We've all followed our opinions, our own desires. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of that sin is death. There's a real heaven, there's a real hell. Not everyone's going to heaven. 
Only those who call on the name of the Lord, the Bible says, will be saved. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess your sins to God, he is faithful, he is just to forgive you of your sin and purify you of all unrighteousness. Front to back, side to side, those listening to this online, if you're not right with God, you've been eating fake food, you've been trusting in yourself, but today you recognize that you say, listen, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty for the real thing. I need forgiveness, I need grace, I need mercy. If that's you and you need to get right with God today, in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to lift your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. We're gonna pray and it's gonna change everything in your life. The bread of life's gonna come and change you and satisfy you. Heal you, forgive you, make all things new. If that's you and you need to get right with God, come on, online and in the house, if that's you, you can respond right now to say, Sam, that's me. Lift up your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. It'd be my joy to pray with you today. God bless you. In the back, anybody else say, Sam, that's me. I need to, I've been trusting in myself, trusting in my own way. God bless you. See your hand as well. Anybody else? God bless you. I see your hand as well. Anybody else say, Sam, I'm ready to get right with God. I need grace and mercy. I want to follow Jesus. I want to give one more opportunity. Come on. Uh, They are begging us in hell to listen today. We can turn to the grace of God. Life is nothing more than a window of time to find God and then the judgment. God loves you so much, but you need to call to him. You got to repent of your sin. In your time of need, reach out to him. One more time, if you need to get right with God today, this is the day, this is the hour, this is that moment. If that's you, just lift up your hand high enough and long enough, one more time for me to see it. We're going to pray and God's going to do something great in your life. Come on. On Freedom Life. Give him a hand today. Come on, celebrate God's goodness in this moment. Come on, we're about to pray. We're about to pray, and then I'm going to pray for you. But this prayer in faith will change everything. Come on, let's pray together out loud. Everybody say, Jesus. Come on, Jesus, today I choose to follow you. Forgive me of my past. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me and make me new. I believe that you died on a cross, that you rose to new life, and you're coming back again for me. And until that day, I will live for you. Right now, by faith, I'm a child of God, forgiven and free in Jesus' name. Whether you raise your hand or not, if you prayed that in faith and you're ready to follow Jesus, you just got born again. Your past is forgiven. Your future is secure. Come on, somebody. When one person turns from their sin, the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices. So we rejoice with you. You're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come in Jesus' name. Now, I want to pray for you. We need to know that there's a world that is passing out fake food. By the way, if you would like to take this home, after the illustration, it'll be down front here. You're like, dude, I love Dave's killer bread. It's my gift to you, okay? Come and check it out. But you and I need to be about what Jesus is about. We're not just religious on Sunday. We get our marching orders on Sunday. And we show up on Monday full of the Holy Ghost and power. The armor of God and the power of God flowing through us. Divine appointments, sharing the goodness of God so the world can taste and see that He is good. Well, Sam, that's not my personality. It wasn't the disciples either, but the Holy Ghost came on them. They were filled with power and they went everywhere all over the world. And they handed out samples of the bread of life and the world was forever changed. And that's what's about to happen in and through you. Do you believe it? Come on, lift your hand to heaven. Father, I prophesy and I declare in Jesus' name, I thank you for supernatural power by your spirit this week, divine appointments, sharing the good news of Jesus, the bread of life that will set people free. I declare and I thank you, Lord, that those around us are about to be saved and set free as we share the good news of the gospel of Jesus. We ask in faith today in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said... 
Hey, thanks for tuning in to our online experience. It's our prayer that you experience the freedom and life that only God has to offer. If you have a prayer request or a question, go ahead and drop us a line, email us at hope at freedom.life. And if this message blessed you, share it on social media, send it to a friend, be a hope dealer. And again, thanks for tuning in. And we believe in your life, the best is still yet to come.